got you there with Shonda Laney. What got you there. I'm Sean Delaney, and today on What Got You There, I talk with Ryan Hawk about his new book, The Pursuit of Excellence, The Uncommon Behavior of the World's Most Productive Achievers. So if you're one of those high achievers who love understanding and distilling down the wisdom of those who've come before us, you are going to love this conversation on achieving excellence with Ryan Hawk. Ryan, welcome back to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Sean, man, it's... it's um. It's good to see you. I'm glad we got to talk a little bit in between times that we've recorded, but it's uh, it's good to see you. Good to be with you. Yeah. For, for the listeners, it, it's so great when we get to hear people on podcasts and kind of see what they're doing out there in the world. But just a behind the scenes perspective, Ryan has really been instrumental. I reached out to him uh, probably a few weeks ago, maybe a little over a month and a half ago, actually, uh, with, with an email. Wasn't expecting a response um, in, in, in any time. And he immediately responds back w- within probably a minute and say, hey, are you free right now? Give me a call. And mm-hmm. automatically, just you spent the next, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes talking to me. And, and what I love about this is it's, it's leadership like actually taking place, right? Like it's not what you're just putting in your books, what you say in your podcast. It's like you deliver. It's, it's how you live. And so I just, I just want the listeners to know um, because I think so many times we idolize leadership, but then behind the scenes, it's different. This is not the case with Ryan. So I, I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate that. But, but before we dive too much into things, I would love to know actually about your peak state. And I know you're a tremendous keynote speaker, obviously do a tremendous job with the podcast. What is it like minutes leading up to a big speech, a podcast, or even just an interview like this in order for you to get in the right mind space to bring your best self forward? It's a good question. I, um, I think one story shares this well. So it was two and a half, three years ago now. I was in Washington, D.C. It was a Sunday in the fall. And I was to deliver a keynote speech to a, a lot of leaders in the um, building slash contractor space. Uh, a lot of really uh, highly intelligent, thoughtful people. Most of them are older than me. And I, uh, as I walk into the hotel ballroom where I was to deliver the speech, I went about two hours early to watch the person before me. And I noticed um, about 10 minutes before I was to go on stage, uh, there were members or people in the audience sitting there with their phones and they had them sideways, you know, landscape, watching their phones like really closely. And I, so I, I, I got curious and I walked up behind them and I peeked and I looked and and they were watching um, like the NFL Red Zone channel, uh, you know, which which kind of the bounces around to all of the games. Remember, it was a Sunday in the fall. And I remember I texted my dad and I said, this is awful. They're not even paying attention to the person on stage. They just want to watch football games and then probably get out of here it's Sunday. And he gave me a good reminder of a, of a mantra that we've talked about for, for years that he has to say to himself, because I think my dad is one of the most humble people I know, yet there is a brief moment and brief moments in his life where you kind of throw that humility aside. And one of those moments is right before you walk up on stage. And he texted me, you're the baddest dude in that room get ready to put on a show. And he had said it to me before. It's again, this has become a mantra of ours before we go up on stage. He has gone up on stages a lot in his life. And it was a great reset, a great reminder for me that you're here for a reason. Throw the humility aside for a second and go up and serve that audience. You are there to change their life. And that sounds grandiose, but uh, I find it helpful. And so that's what I tried to do is, is to go up there and deliver and to serve that audience. And the cool thing about that specific day, Sean, is um, it's, it, it has led to more than 10 keynote speeches of people who were in that audience on that day. And so I think it's the greatest mark of if you made a difference or not when you're giving a speech is how many people book you for maybe one of their events later on in the year, um, because uh, a lot of these these high level people have their own events outside of this one conference that I was at. So that was a longer way of me sharing that it was is a great reset. It's 
co- totally against kind of like how our family normally is. Mm-hmm. But in those, there are these moments in your life where you need to be the baddest dude in the room. And, and for me, uh, right before I walk on stage is a mantra that I say to myself every time now. No, Ryan, what I really appreciate this though, is the intentionality you bring to that, right? Like you're trying to be a conduit for good and really deliver and, and raise excellence out of those people you're giving that speech to. I just think that's so important. Like, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish when you go into a different arena and then deliver that and get the most out of it? But you bring up something that's really, really cool. And w- what I see a lot amongst high performers is when that adversity sets in, instead of letting that downward spiral happen, they go the opposite way. Same thing with you, right? Like everyone's watching NFL red zone and you could have just let that overwhelm kick in. So what do you do specifically in order to kind of like redirect that downward spiral into that positive upward spiral? I think, um, some of it is kind of how you phrase it. Uh, instead of have to it's get to, I mean, Hmm. I, I try to remember. So in that instance with the same story, I mean, I realize how hard it is to be in that position and how fortunate I am to be the one that gets to do it. And so it's just a great reminder of, I have an opportunity to change someone's life today, even if it's only one person, but I have the opportunity to do that. I get to do that. Don't waste it. Let me make the most of this. Just like you, I, I, I saw all of your prep done for this conversation with me. We've emailed back and forth leading up to it. You sent me a bunch of bullet points and thoughts. I get the sense that you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I, I'd love to hear more about this from you. I get the sense that you're the type of guy too that doesn't waste these opportunities. Doesn't Because you could probably mail this one in. You and I know each other enough that you probably don't have to prep and you would still do a good job, yet you do the opposite, right? You're overly prepared for this. You send it to me. You let me know I'm ready to go. You've already exhibited that preparation early on in this conversation. That's different, right? That's harder. It's easier just to kind of show up and wing it because you've done it hundreds of times. And yet, you choose to view this as an opportunity not to waste, to make the most of it. And I try to view view the opportunities and the things that I get to do the same way is let's make the most of this. Let's change somebody's life. Let's make a difference, right? And I think that that leaves me much more fulfilled mm-hmm. by the end result and is the fact that maybe, maybe we change somebody for the better. Yeah, I mean... It, I, I, maybe just the natural process, right? Like I can't imagine getting to talk to someone that I highly respect and not only respect for like a short period of time, like you've been in my life and impact me for years where I, I owe it to you. And then obviously the listeners where it's like, of course, like I literally read every single page of your book. Like I literally was like trying to get in Ryan Hawk's head all morning. Like it wasn't, I wasn't Sean. I was literally trying to be like Ryan Hawk. What does it feel like? <laughs> and so like, yeah, like the intentionality there, um, it's important, but like you, like I, I just don't know otherwise. I would feel so scared entering this conversation out of respect to you if that process wasn't done. Um, and that, this, this probably ties into so much about what well, that, you're new. Yeah, I think I, so. Real quick, that level of productive paranoia, as Jim Collins writes <laughs> yeah. about in his books, is great fuel, man. Like I have healthy dose of productive paranoia all the time, and I sense you do too. And I've sensed this to be a commonality among people who perform at high levels over an extended period of time. I remember, uh, have you ever watched the show Impractical Jokers? No, I haven't. It's, it's, on, it's, it's on Comedy Central. It, uh, I've seen these guys live. Sol, Sol Volcano, I had him on my podcast years ago. And this dude was kind of, the, his TV show has blown up. Like it, it's been all over the place. They do a world tour and they've done extremely well. And I, and I asked him, like, you, he still, still seemed so nervous that it was going to end tomorrow, always. And I go, Sal, Sal, like, you've completely exploded. It's everywhere. You've blown up. And he goes, man, I still feel like it could end tomorrow. And that's right. because he's just an, he's an insane overworker. And I thought, like, it's just another reminder, even somebody who's gone all over the place, who's all over TV and tours the world, he still has a healthy dose of productive paranoia, and that's part of what drives him and fuels him to keep at it. Yeah, you, you've definitely hit on a serious commonality there. I mean, those people who achieve excellence but then sustain it, which I think is the mo- more important and incredible a- attribute of that, is they're, they're, they always feel like they're being tr- chased by something, right? Like they wake up and they're just being chased. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad you, you highlighted that because, yeah, it's, it's something I've seen uh, throughout other high performers as well. And I want to hit on because your your new book, 
brings a lot of insights, uh, these commonalities amongst the, these high performers. But I would love to know the difference between success and excellence, because you do a great job articulating the differences in this. Yeah. Uh, and this came from my conversations with my friend, Brooke Cups, who is a, a great high school basketball coach. Uh, success is a comparison to others. Uh, excellence to me is a comparison to yourself. So that's the primary difference. And so I usually don't use that word. I, I think I think it's okay to use success. I think it's just hard to define and everybody has their own definition, which maybe that's just the way it should be. To me, the, the way I, the, what I think about more is excellence and excellence is about a compar- comparison to my previous self. And so it's this constant viewpoint of the world of Am I improving? Not only am I improving, but what specifically am I doing to ensure that improvement happens? And that's part of like the daily routine in the process in order to to have this trajectory that's like this, that's slowly going upward as opposed to going down. So to me, yeah, success is the comparison to others and, and excellence is a comparison to yourself. So then in your approach, both sports, business, entrepreneurship, everything like that, is this, are you trying to be the best or are you trying to be your best? Well, I'm just trying to be better. Gotcha. Um, I, 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 I obviously I want to be the best version of myself every day, but this, I, I don't even know how you would measure like who's the best. Mm-hmm. I mean, people can say that, um, to me, if I am constantly striving to be better and to improve, I think the score will take care of itself and you could define the score for you, whatever way it is, whether that's books, podcasts, the opportunity to do this work and make a living like that's part of the score for me. So I, 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 to me, it's just a constant drive to be a little bit better each day and and do my habits and my daily actions align with that mantra, that ethos of trying to be better. And I can, I can grade myself on that. I can reflect on that. I can actually see if I'm passing that test. And that's why I try to regularly reflect on that. Is this a never ending game for you? Or is there some end, end goal, end state you're hoping to achieve uh, and then move on from there? I don't really see an end. Uh, I, I don't think there's ever going to be a moment where you arrive. Uh, I think it's just this always becoming mindset. So yeah, I don't necessarily see that. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I mean, maybe it is. Maybe maybe you should have some sort of uh, a desire to say, "Well, yeah, I've kind of got there." I I don't I don't know. Uh, at least for me, I don't think that day will ever come. Uh, I I just sense that it's just always again this kind of trajectory of the slow growth moving forward and trying to get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And again, then the 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 good things seem to take care of themselves once. When, when I, with that approach, at least I, I've found. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to keep at it. With the good things that take care of themselves or seem to, was that something you were able to see and understand earlier in your career? Or does that just take experience? Uh, both. So if you talk about sports, the reason that I started doing well, let's say even on the football field, that I was able to recognize in, early in high school is because of the work and preparation in January and mm. February and June and July and August. So that by the time Friday nights in the fall came about the, it, we, it almost became automatic. Our actions as a team, our prep, our conditioning, our level of, of being ready to go our, our ability to, to beat teams that were uh, probably more talented than, than us because we were better conditioned and better prepared had better coaching um, I learned that like prep preparation and resilience and ability to persevere and ability to keep going consistently, the score then took care of itself. Um, and there is in sports, there is a clear scoreboard, right? Life is not necessarily like that, but in sports there are. So I've kind of taken what I learned from the athletic fields and tried to implement a simple, similar mentality into the work I do now. And fortunately, if, if you, you keep at it, the score starts taking care of itself. And, uh, and for me, that's, that's been, um, that's, that's, that's then builds confidence, right. And, and say like, okay, I think I'm on the right track. Now let's just, let's just keep going at it so that we can keep getting better and better. And who knows what we can accomplish if we stick, stick to this process. Can you talk about your approach to confidence early on? Like those initial days when you're entering a new domain, right? Like even the first time with your first book, 
what is that like? I'm just wondering what the internal dialogue is like for Ryan Hawk when he's first of starting confidence something. of how to build confidence. Well, I, I, yeah, I kind of think about like entering the unknown, right? Like when you yeah. were releasing your first book, like they're just unknown unknowns. And so like so many people allow that to be debilitating and they never step forward into that unknown, but you, you've done this again and again, and you've gone into the unknown. So I'm wondering what the internal dialogue is like for you to instill that confidence within yourself and then be able to step forward. You know, really, again, Sean, I appreciate the, your thoughtfulness. I think what's helped me is, um, so my first job when I got done playing, so I played football in high school and college and a little bit in the Arena League and in Canadian League for, a, for like a week. Um, my first job was an, uh, a telephonic sales rep at a company called LexisNexis, and I got shifted to new business sales right away. So new business sales, you're calling people who are using something else, not your product. And you got to convince them to switch to yours. And so when you have a job like that, you are regularly hung up on, they don't answer, they don't call you back, or they just flat out tell you to stop or they say no. So you lose 96% of the time, maybe more, maybe 99, 98, 99, you lose, you get a, you get a, 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 a full-blown rejection. And so I did that job for years and I think I got calloused and conditioned to lose and to not really care, hmm. to be able to keep going and keep going through all of the losses, through all of the rejection, through all of the being ignored. So to me, if like I'm going to do everything I can for it to go well, but if it doesn't, I mean, I'm just going to keep going. I, I, and so I, I think that that helped me was, was just to, like, I think as I as I really reflect on that those those first jobs I had, I'm very grateful for them. Even though in the moment I didn't realize it, I'm very grateful that they were so hard, that there was so much losing as part of it, and that most people didn't want to do it. And if you found a way to kind of break through and do well, it was very lucrative. It was very fun. It was very rewarding, um, and it built these calluses and these skills that have since helped me since then. So I guess when it comes to a book, did I know how it was going to do? I did not. Now, I knew I was going to do everything I could to help it go well, to help it get out into the world. And fortunately, it's done pretty well. It seems to help people. It seems to be a topic that's important. This this leap from individual contributor to first-time manager, that that seems to resonate. And now it's it's even selling more as of now than it did when it launched, which is a great feeling because it's more of an evergreen book and not just a, hey, let's have a big launch and then it dies. So to me, that's kind of the mark of, of good work. And I, I continually trying to help that spread, but I didn't know. I mean, I had no idea how that was going to go, but I was okay with the fact that if it flops, yes, I will be upset. I'd be bummed, but I'm, I'm just going to keep going and go on to the next thing. Well, it's great, right? Like, even if it does flop, that that's all experience. That's all new right. knowledge that you can use moving forward. Your your smile and dial story makes me think. So I was exploring kind of just like the the progression, uh, both athletic and business in my own self. So I was kind of like playing with this the other day. And it, it makes me think, I kind of view this as you're on, you're on this teeter-totter, this seesaw, right? Like where you're just getting rejected 96% of the time. But I am wondering, were you having wins during that time? to build confidence. The, the way I think about this, I'll, I'll tell you like my athletic career is through most of my time, I was on teams where I was the best, like on the team in the league. But then at the same time, in conjunction with that, I was playing on travel teams where I was like the lowest guy on the totem pole, where I had people so far better than me that it was just like, wow, I wasn't even aware there were people this good. And so I kind of think about like, that was very helpful because when I was on those teams where I, I was one of the better ones, it built up that confidence and allowed me to then try to teach my skills to others. But then I enter the new domain where I was the absolute beginner. And it was just like full on beginner's mindset. Let me absorb as much knowledge as possible. I'm wondering if you've experienced anything like that. Clearly, I'm just like thinking out loud of the new concept I was playing with the other day, but I would just love to get your take on that. Sure. Yeah. I think to me, um, I had never sold a thing in my life before mm -hmm. that first job. I had never had a real job in my life. Uh, and mainly focused on sports um, and was, was fortunate to, to get a scholarship because of that. So uh, I went in thinking like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and I was very fortunate to have <clears throat> good mentors who helped me. And 
I actually interviewed the top 10 performers in the stack rankings in the sales world. Like they're, they're publishing stack rankings every day. You know exactly where you stand. And that can be, and I don't know if that's sustainable long-term because at times like you just, it, it can really be debilitating to constantly see these stack rankings. But anyway, you know, so I, I, I try to take bits and pieces from each of those people. And then as I would m- really mash them together with my own personality and try things out and get embarrassed and get hung up on and get rejected, every once in a while, you get a win. And then you get another win. And you start stringing these things together. And before you know it, you're that person at the top of the stack rankings because you had this willingness to really to work and to learn and to and to not really be that upset or scared with rejection and just keep at it to me so i think i think the beginning stages of that job going well was purely about a combination of getting help from people who were far wiser than me who had more experience than me who had done it really well for years as well as just kind of not ever stopping, just continuing to go and and to do extra work in order to get to a place to where, okay, this is working. And then you start building confidence because you you reflect and see, oh, oh, this is going okay. This is going all right. Let me keep at it. Let me keep trying to get better and better and better. Again, I still draw from that experience to this day. Ryan, two things that I absolutely love there. One, you talk about like talking to the mentors, people who are above you, but then you said, but then I integrate it into, into who I am. And like that synthesis, that merger, we were taking the best lessons, but how this worked best for me, I think that's like one of those key steps when people really start to pivot and accelerate, whether it be their career or whatever it is. I just think that's really, really cool there to hear about that. And I also love how you hit on the fact that you talk to these people who are far above you and you're not trying to accomplish what they're accomplishing yet. You're tackling those little things and finding the joy and the confidence building in each one of those little steps. And then over time, the aggregation of those little things lead to those bigger steps. And then you're top of the totem pole. I just think that's really important because so it's so easy today to look to people 10 years our senior and want to accomplish what they're accomplishing. And we forget about the nine years of little wins they had to do to get to that point. So I just have so much respect for people yeah. who not only it, take that approach, but understand it. If, if you do get caught into this success world of comparing yourself against others, don't compare your year one to somebody else's yeah. year nine. You know what I mean? There, it's a completely different stage of life and stage of career. So if you do that, uh, I still don't necessarily advise that. Although some people, it does motivate them and help yeah. them. So to them, great. Um, but try to, m- to make an accurate measurement because uh, that's not really, I don't know. I haven't found that to be helpful if you're, if you're measuring yourself at a time when it's just not even relatable to the person that you're measuring yourself against. Absolutely. And once again, you highlight the fact that you, you got to know yourself, right? Like you got to do the right. inner work to understand how you best operate. One thing I'm so intrigued by is, is we're kind of both operating in the knowledge space a lot. So not everything we do, there's clear metrics, right? Like podcast episode, you can see releases, a book, you can see sales. But a lot of this is just like knowledge exploration. Um, it, it's really hard to put clear goals and objective goals on. So I'm just wondering how you analyze the gap between like where you are to where you're trying to get to in pursuit of more knowledge and then even just the unknown of just putting yourself in a better position for opportunities that might come up in the future. Yeah. I have kind of a love hate relationship with goal (laughs) setting. I've had years where I've set goals and years where I haven't 2022 is a year where I decided to set goals, but I really, I I went through um, a process of, of really getting clear on my core values. I would say over the course of the past 18 months. And, and so I, I think, Goals, in my opinion, should be aligned with those core values. So the four that that are that are big for me are being thoughtful, thankful, curious, and consistent. And so I've created goals that are aligned with being thoughtful, thankful, curious, and consistent. So I'll, I'll go through them if you want. But for 2022, my curiosity and consistent goals: publish 52 episodes of my podcast, The Learning Le- Learning Leader Show. Now I've done this for a few years. But as, as you know, it's still really hard to be that consistent to publish at least one per week. But, but so that, 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 that hits the curiosity and consistency because you got to be curious, right, to do this show, to do a podcast really well and to, and to ship at least once per week. You got to be very consistent. Uh, also, I'm going to, I'm going to send out my mindful Monday email every single Monday of 2022. Again, I've done this before. But still really hard, still takes hours upon hours per week to write, to curate, to put it together. That, that hits curiosity and consistency. Thoughtfulness, 
This is something that is hard to define, but I had a guest on named Matthew Dix, who um, was an amazing guy. He's a great storyteller, but he has this, this thing called homework for life. Basically, at the end of each day, you reflect on the highlight stories of that day, homework for life. And what this does is this helps you, one, remember the great stories of your life, whether they're with your family or, or professionally or both. It also helps, actually helps slow down time. You know, you talk to people and they say things like, oh, my goodness, the year flew by or I can't believe, you know, my kid was two and now they're seven, you know, like it flew by. Well, homework for life helps you spend time in reflection each day, remembering those stories. It helps you become a more thoughtful person, which again is one of my core values. That's, that's important. And then thankful to be, to show more gratitude and to live out the value of, of being grateful. I'm committed to writing 100 thank you notes, writing them, putting them in an envelope, putting a stamp on it and sending it out and keeping track in a Google sheet. So to me, I do say, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Well, what am I doing to actually show that? Well, now I'm actually putting metrics and numbers to them. So those are all really process-oriented goals that I have complete control over them. None of them are outcome-based goals like I need this many downloads or this many book sales, or I need to rank at this certain level on, the, on, the, on some random chart. I, those things are out of my control. I can't do anything to... I guess there are weird things that you can pay to, to play in some of these instances. I'm not going to do that. So what, what I'm focused on are process related goals that I have complete control over and I'll measure myself against those that they're hard, but they also are realistic that I know I can do them if I'm focused on, on the daily action. So that's how I've chosen to set goals for this year. You, you bring up two things. I know for a fact earlier in my career, I, I would have just missed this in this conversation. That is process over outcome goals. Way too many times we set up the goals and have that outcome. And then the second that outcome isn't reached, utter failure, we're upset with our goals. The one I think that's even more important that you highlight, though, is value alignment in terms of our goals. It's too many times earlier in my career, I would set goals that actually were at tension. I might have thought they were in conjunction with my values and then only to find out they weren't. So that those are two, I think, foundationally game-changing things. When you, when you truly break down what your values are, set up your goals in alignment with those values, and then obviously it's process over outcomes in achievement of those goals. That way you're in control. You, you can't let those, those outer games affect your internal state. And when you do those outcome-based goals, so I just think, Ryan, that is just exceptional. Uh, I'm just like, really appreciative you bring that up. Well, I, I mean, too, it's like, I want to enjoy this. Like I feel very fortunate. So if I set these crazy goals and and I don't hit them, I don't want to live in this perpetual state of missing goals. That just doesn't seem very fun for me. And I trust me, like in the in the selling world, you have these, you get you get given your sales goal every every month, every quarter, every year. And yes, I I was motivated to exceed those goals. Uh, I felt like that was winning. So I understand how those can work. I don't know if it's sustainable for me to be content and happy and to be a good husband and a good dad if I'm in this perpetual state of like, God, I keep missing all of my goals. To me, I want to set goals that then if I do them, again, the results and the score should take care of itself. But, but a lot of it's out of my control. But the stuff that is within my control, I'm going to work really hard to, to make sure that I do that well. And, and that's, that's why I'm a believer in these these process related process oriented goals um, and focusing on doing that work each day, as opposed to setting these, like, I'm going to sell a million books this year. Well, I, I mean, I would love to sell a million books. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, I don't really, there's only so much I can do to see if a million, I mean, James clear just wrote about the fact that, you know, he sold 5 million copies of atomic habits in the third year as the number one selling book on Amazon for 2021. It's the greatest thing ever, but at some point it became out of his control. What was in his control was writing an excellent book and marketing it well at the start and hopefully keeping it going. And now it's taken on a life of its own. Like he, it's kind of out of his hands. You know, that, 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 at that part of it, there's no way you could have set a goal to sell 5 million books and be like, well, yeah, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm yeah. going to be able to make it sell five. No, I mean, he wrote a great book. And fortunately, word of mouth is really powerful once, once it catches on. So I think that's why it's like focus on the process and, and the, the, um, instead of focusing on just the results. Yeah, it's so apparent that you've set such a strong foundation to build long lasting, sustained excellence. Obviously, this is one of the, the key things you write about, but like you really have built that strong foundation, which is great. You mentioned this actually one of the years you are setting goals. Uh, I know this is going to be released a few years, a few uh, weeks into January. I am just wondering any other 
reflection, things that you do to both understand the year previous and then set yourself up for success in the new year? Anything else you're toying with right now? I do think it's good to uh, to write a year in year in review and reflection uh, and letter and 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 maybe even publish it. I chose to I, I choose to publish these. I did one for twenty. Uh, 21, as well as looking ahead to 2022 with those goals, where you kind of look through your calendar, you look through what you did, what you were able to accomplish, how the year went, what what, what you're happy about, what you're not. Um, I think just spending time in reflection and taking those thoughts from your mind down onto the page is a is a great exercise for for everyone to do, whether you decide to publish them or not. It's still useful to regularly reflect, and and to me, I don't know about you, Sean, but I'm a, I may have said this to you in an earlier call. I'm a prompt driven writer. So when I hire writing coaches or editors to help me, I love it when they send me prompts. I love it when they send me questions and then I can respond to those questions in writing. And then I get clear on what I believe, clearer on what I think through answering those prompts and questions. So to me, uh, creating prompts for yourself to review your year and to look ahead a bit, I think is a really useful practice. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement, right? You want better answers in life. You got to have better questions. And those questions yes. can both drive your thinking, but then also get you crystal clear. And I, I'm in agreement that one of the things that I do also is I write out um, what, what I'm thinking because it can be in my head um, and I'm just not clear yet. I, I can I, I can formulate in my head. I can think I'm clear until that thing is on paper. I truly haven't distilled down my thinking enough. Uh, so, so I love that. I, I know we're kind of talking about like new year type changes, things like that. One of the things that I love is that people change in an instant. And one of the people you write about in your book, The Pursuit of Excellence is Ryan Serhan. So and anyone who's familiar with the show, Million Dollar Listing, my wife's a huge fan of the show. So I've watched it for a number of years. So I'm familiar with Ryan Serhan. But what you bring up is here was this guy who was essentially like hands in his pocket, wouldn't look <laughs> you in the eye, no confidence. And then within four years, he leads the team that sells more real estate in New York City than anyone, anyone else. It's basically like a billion and a half bucks through a real estate team. And I just find two things fascinating with that, both that he realized that he wanted to change who he was and was able to make that change. But then also the results that he was able to get with that focus, that intentionality in, in four years. Um, so I, I would love to just know what you've taken away from Ryan, because I know you've interviewed him and that just can really help someone who's saying, you know what, I actually do want to make a change and I want like drastic change here. I would love to know what you've taken away from him. He really believes in doing a self audit. Uh, regularly getting the feedback from people who you trust, people who you respect, and people who have the guts and the love and the care and the willingness to tell you the truth. And that's what helped him the most was doing a, that initial self-audit when he couldn't look you in the eye and his hands were in his pockets all the time to becoming one of the most charismatic characters on TV. And to me... This is why it's so important that your who, those people you're surrounded by, are of high character and high quality, and you admire the way in which they go about doing the work, and they care enough about you to tell you the truth. Most of the time, when you ask somebody for feedback, they'll say, oh, Sean, great job, man. It was awesome. Good, good work. Good job, right? The kind of empty platitudes that yes, it does kind of feel kind of good. Hey, good job, man. But really the, the friends and the people that I'm surrounded by that I value the most are the ones who actually have the heart and the love and the care to tell me when I'm not doing something well and how I could potentially do it better. It is, it is much easier and it's selfish to not tell you the truth. It's harder and it's selfless to tell you the truth, Sean, you could have done this better. Or you know that, 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 that chapter or the beginnings of that, it's not very good. I had a friend of mine named Jeff Estel who read the, read, I, I, he was an early reader for me because he's an amazing writer, very smart guy. He's in one of my leadership circles. He has been since the beginning. And I sent him an early copy and he, and he, and he said to me, and, and I, you know, there's probably like at this point, eight to nine early readers. And most of them did a good job, but he was the first one that said, dude, the opening of the entire book is boring. Why are you doing that? In fact, on page four, 
where you talk about, you know, it's one of the Wright Brothers stories, which I'm, I know you've read now. The way he goes, how about we rework that and then put that as the very first words of the book? And he helped me rewrite it a little bit. And then we moved it around. We deleted the entire boring section that he said and moved that to the very first words of the book. It's a life changing moment for me because, as you know, like the beginnings of things are really important. But it would have been so much easier for Jeff to just say, like, great job, man. Awesome. So cool that you've written a second book. Oh, oh, amazing. You know, and most people do that. And yet he said the first part, not only did he say, like, oh, it's uh, it's just okay. He goes, it's boring. And when I hear that, I go, immediate red pen through that part, right? I can't have even one person saying that. So that took love. That took care. That took him putting me before himself. Because if I would have said like, who the hell does he think he is? You know, he hasn't written a book. I'm written my second one. He doesn't know what he's taught, right? If I got defensive, I said those types of things that, you know, I guess could happen. My book's much worse for it. So uh, I give him huge credit and I treasure him. I've told him this uh, multiple times that like those types of friends who care enough to do that are are critical. And that's why Ryan Serhant does the self audit on a regular basis. And we all should do these self audits to find those people who will tell you the truth and give you the feedback for for the hope that it could help you get a little bit better. And in his case, it certainly has led to um, a a business that has done quite well. And, And for me, um, I, I treasure those people. I try to be the same for them. I try to be the same for others, but it's hard. It's hard. And so when you find people like that, it's like love on them, take care of them, do whatever you can to make sure that you keep uh, maintaining and, and, and strengthening the relationships like that. Yeah, it is hard. And like you hit on, it's a two-way street. Both you have to have those truth tellers in your life, but you also have to be there for them. But then also when they push back with that tough feedback, you've got to get the way I think about it is, uh, Jim Dedmer's conscious leadership above the line or below the line. You've got to get curious about that feedback. It's like, what is this feedback trying to tell me as opposed to letting that ego get in the way and getting defensive there. So I think that's so crucial. I I would just love to know um, around the self audit. Is there anything specifically that Ryan did just in case no one's familiar with the self audit? What what exactly did he do? um, So the one about a self audit. One of the questions to ask is what do you say about me when I'm not around? How do you describe me to other people when I'm not around? Right. And, and, the, and this is when he had friends who cared enough about him to say, you can't look me in the eye. Your hands are in your pockets. You're looking at your feet. Um, that's, that's how, you know, that, that, that's the type of like quiet, whatever. That, that's how people were describing him. So you could, I think that's a really useful question. How do you describe him? When I do, I do these 360s for leaders now where I, I, I interview people who are above them, beside them, and below them within their organization as part of the work that I do with leadership teams. And that's one of the questions I always ask. Like, what do people say about him or her when they're not around, what it, like get real with me and really push on them to get a good answer. Like, what is their what is their brand? What are they known for when they're not around? What do people say behind their back? What are they saying? And and if you if you really you could you could really learn a lot by asking that question. So I think that's something useful to ask your friends to ask your the, the, the your who uh, what do you how do you describe them when you're not around? Yeah, you mentioned learning a lot. One of the, one of the ways I learn best is just kind of like trying to understand what some of these high achievers are doing behind the scenes that most people don't see. And so I'm wondering for you, I know just like how committed you are to process. What are you doing that might be considered like quirky or just people wouldn't know about that the the work you're doing behind the scenes and anything you do that's unique that someone else might get some value from? Hmm. I guess it's hard because it's not unique to me. It just becomes normal. So, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I I think everything has become. I mean, I'm a pretty regimented person. Uh, I I come into my office pretty much every day. Um, you know, some I remember like even my parents or others will say like, "Well, do you have time off for the holidays?" and and I'd say, "Well, I just I don't have a job. You know, I have a lot of work to do. So I just don't view it as like having a job. I view it as work to do. And that that to me, I'm not talented enough to not work quite a bit. So I, I don't know if that's quirky. I, I just think I don't view what I do as a job. I view it as hard work. 
And, and I love it. And if it's, and, it, and it's what I was choosing to do with my free time when I actually had a real job and I was doing this on the side, you know, fortunately four years ago, a little four and a half now, I guess I was able to leave that and do this full time. But uh, to me, it's, I, I guess I just view it as, as kind of showing up and doing the work each day, part of my, my, my rituals. Ryan, you, you've got to talk about that entering the unknown though, right? Like leading a, a very comfortable, very successful full-time job to enter yeah. in the end, the known. I, I want to know what that is like both internally and then also having a spouse, having kids that you've got to think about. I mean, the, the, those are serious demands. It's not like you're 24 single and it's like, hey, I, I'm going to jump into this. So I, I would love to know what that looks like because so many people don't do that. I'm not saying this is the right decision for everyone. I would just love to know what, what that's like as someone who's so committed to their family and their relationships as I know you are. Yeah, I think part of it is having an extremely supportive partner. Um, if, if my wife Miranda didn't have complete belief and faith in me, um, it would not have been possible. Um, you know, when I initially left the corporate world, I was a VP of sales at a company called Elsevier clinical solutions, which is a sister company of LexisNexis, which is where I started. Um, it's one of those really like nice salary and even better, uh, quarterly bonus type jobs. So you're, you're getting paid quite a bit. And I, I walked away. Um, there was no severance or no money. The day that I left, I got, I stopped getting paid by them. And, um, and so for three years now, I mean, we're, we're, I'm just, just getting to the point where I'm, you know, we're doing better financially, but so like for three years, that first year we financially made significantly less. Um, and, and having her support and belief that I would be able to, to build this with, with a great community of people around me, around this kind of learning leader movement, um, that it would work. Um, and she also, I think knows kind of how much work I'd be willing to put into it because I do love it. So I would say that's been the key to really everything is, and then to me, it's just this desire to, uh, help other people in a way that I've seen the people that I admire the most help others like my dad, my grandpa, and other great mentors of mine who are, are have kind of built a life out of that. Maybe they've done a little bit differently than me by staying a part of corporate America. But I think that's one motivation for me. And another one too is I think as a dad, um, being able to say that you've created your own business, your own um, ability to earn a living and be a provider for your family in a way that you could have never predicted, to me is inspiring because it tells them that they could do something like that. And I have no idea what that could be. When I was their age, a podcast didn't exist. YouTube didn't exist or any of these things didn't exist. The thought of being a published author was not even in the realm of possibility. So I don't know what that could be for them, but I'm inspired and, and, and am motivated to show them that the possibilities are endless if you're willing to work. Um, so that's why I think I, I, all of that kind of goes together as to why I elected to leave. The other part of it is, and I, I didn't have any intention of this, I, I did think if it doesn't work and it flops and, I, and I, it's just not happening, I could probably get a job. I could probably get a job. So I think that was part of why I said, like, it's not like you have a backup plan, but it's like, I probably could if I absolutely had to in order to support my family. So all those things combined helped me, you know, pull the trigger and, and make that move now almost four and a half years ago. And that takes a lot of courage. I appreciate when someone's willing to step into the unknown like that. One of the things that you mentioned a minute ago that just is like true to my core as well. And that's kind of like, opening up and unleashing the potential in others. A lot of times when it's unseen in themselves, and you mentioned you had great mentors that were able to do that for you, and you feel committed to doing that for others. What have you seen work incredibly well to unlock the potential in others? I know that's kind of a, a broad and, and tough one to define, but I know we have a lot of other leaders on this show, and they're trying to get the best out of their kids, their employees, their, their athletes. And I would just love to know what you've seen both in yourself, your mentors, and then all of these other achievers of excellence that, that you've been fortunate enough to work with in an interview. Uh, there's a great story I write about uh, with Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, um, where Edison said to form like, son, you have it. 
keep going. And, and, and Ford said like to that moment, I never had somebody who believed in me, like who I admired that much. And I, so I think in a way, like understand the weight that your words carry as a leader. And when you, when, when you're respected and, and, and people maybe look up to you, when you give them encouragement and belief and you're willing to be there for them, you could potentially play a role in lifting them to levels of performance that they themselves did not think were possible. I learned this early on as an eighth grader going into my freshman year when the varsity coaches, Bob Gregg and Ron Allery came to me and said, you could be a guy, right? Like you, if you're willing to work, you could really be a guy. And at that point I was a pretty good player, but not like exceptional to the point where they said like, you could get a college scholarship or you could just be the starting quarterback was, was enough for me. And they thought they, they pushed me to think bigger. They pushed me to work harder. And I'm so grateful, even though there are times when I didn't necessarily love them at the moment, in the moment, because of how hard they were on me, they knew I was capable of more. They knew that I was capable of more than I thought I was capable of. So I, I like to think of like uh, view as a leader, like view yourself, like a talent scout. And so you're kind of like constantly scanning. That's why when you reached out about, you know, looking for some, some conversations about book writing, like, like I obviously think very highly of you and wanted to take that call immediately. And then we did it right. And then, you know, puts you in contact with other people that could potentially help out because I think it's, I love the thought of being able to help somebody accomplish something. Uh, my dad has always told me like life is so much richer when your success follows the success of others. Again, he used the word success, which is fine in this context, I guess. But when you see it, that it follows others doing well. And, and so I try to live by that, uh, by, by that too. Like the world is, is so not zero sum. There is plenty out there for all of us to win and to do well. And so uh, to me, it's just like, let's do whatever we, at whatever we can to try to help other, other, to try to help good things happen for other people. It's like, what an awesome, rich, rewarding feeling. If you can even play a small, small role in helping other people do that, like that's just, that's like fulfillment, man. Like that's being content. That's, that's the fun part of all this stuff. So uh, to me, I, I think it's like just believing in somebody and making sure that they know it. And then if you can help do whatever it is you can to help that, that's, that's really what this is all about. Yeah, Ryan, you and I are just so in alignment with those positive sum games and getting to experience the wins of others and just how deeply rewarding that is. I also appreciated in the book, you brought up that, that Ford and Edison story. So uh, uh, they ended up buying houses right by each other, their, their winter homes. And I'm actually right down the street from their winter estates. So I'm oh, obsessed. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm literally right down the street <laughs> from them uh, or, or, or where their estates currently are. Uh, so I just found that fascinating, right? Like you have Ford and Edison, like two of the biggest Titans in the entire world, just like hanging out all winter together. It would be yep. like Musk and Bezos, just like, you know, cracking the afternoon yep. cocktail every day, just hanging out. I just thought that was so cool. But one of the quotes you bring up in the book, this is one of my favorite. This is from The Economist uh, down in George Mason, Tyler Cowan. And that's at critical moments in time, you can raise the aspirations of other people significantly, especially when they're relatively young, simply by suggesting they do something better or more ambitiously than what they might have in mind. It costs you relatively little to do, but the benefit to them and the broader world may be enormous. I just like it. Love that. It's just so true. And to start how we started this call, it's something that you do and think about every single day. Um, but, but talking about the book and just like the aggregation of all of the insights and wisdom you've distilled down with, with your second book, The Pursuit of Excellence, I would love to know, like, when was the idea that, oh, wow, like I have a ton of knowledge and experience here and then putting it together in this book, The Pursuit of Excellence, how did that come to be? I, uh, spoke with a number of people on my podcast off air about the, the ones that had written multiple books. And I asked them, how did you come up with the idea for the next one? And then the next one and the next one. I remember I had a conversation with Todd Henry. Todd is an amazing, amazing guy. He lives about an hour away from me. He's in Cincinnati. I'm in Dayton uh, in Ohio. And he goes, uh, I usually read through my previous book or books and I find a part of the book that I really was fascinated by or curious about, but didn't really get to go too deep in. And then maybe that idea could be a full book. 
And I thought, what, what a great piece of advice. And so that's what I did. And if it, my first book, in Welcome to Management, there's a big, you know, section one's on, on leading yourself. And there's, there's, there's these components of kind of sustaining excellence as a part of that leading yourself. And so with the pursuit of excellence, I found, one, I love that phrase. I love the pursuit of excellence. I love being in pursuit of something. I love excellence. It's the perfect title for me. I love uncommon behaviors of productive achievers, right? The subtitle, productive achievers are people who achieve things in a way that's productive for society, productive for themselves, productive for other people. So like the titling is perfect for what I believe in, maybe more so than, than, than anything I'll do. And to me though, there was just this uh, treasure trove of information that I had gathered over many years, both on the podcast and off the podcast that I wanted to get out. And so to me, it was in this, the, 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 the overarching theme is, is in this pursuit of excellence, which is not necessarily something you may ever achieve, but it's always in pursuit of it. And, be, and if you consistently stay in that pursuit, that's when the good things can really happen. Again, we, that's like the theme of this conversation, the score could take care of itself. So that's really what what drove me to write this one. So whereas my first book was really niched down to a specific time in your career when you get promoted for that first time to be a first-time manager, this one's more about leading yourself first for the betterment of yourself as well as those people around you. And to, and to me, I don't, from a leadership perspective, if you don't take time to lead yourself first, nothing else really matters. You're not going to be a good leader for other people. So it is still a leadership book, but it's really focused on what I think is most important. That's leading yourself first, hopefully for the benefit of others. Yeah. Your language speaks so true to my core. It's so funny. Uh, mentioned these uncommon behaviors. So I've had a word document uh, I've had for a number of years now called uncommon commonalities. And it's essentially like when I come across one of these, it's just, so like I saw that language, I was like, man, this is like, it's home so much to me. I, I would love to know though, what one of these uncommon behaviors, like there's going to be foundational ones that probably get more play um, than others. Is there one for you though, that is, is pretty much under the radar and might even remain under the radar even after your book comes out. But you're like, mm. wow, this, this is really one of those interesting ones. I wish people had more thought into. I think uh, <laughs> as you do more, I bet you, I, I, I want to ask you this too. So you tell me what you think. Something that has actually been inspiring for me is I'll meet somebody who is like otherworldly to me, right? And, and you've got to meet these people through doing your podcast. And the more you get to know them, the more you realize that they are okay living in the space that we're all just trying to figure this out as we go. <laughs> You know this, what I mean? Where this, this is so true. And just they're brilliant. They're brilliant. Yeah. And you're like, well, they've got life figured out. Yeah. Like they got parenting figured out. They got the marriage figured out. They've got their, whatever the area of specialty figured out, but then you kind of get to know them more and more and more. And they become more of a, just a, a, a real human. Yeah. And to me, it's inspiring because you put these people on a pedestal when you don't really know them. And then as you get to know them, you're like, oh Yeah. You know, they're figured and, and they'll tell you that sometimes like off air or whatever, or some on air. But to me, I found that, that, that they are OK living in the space that w none of us really know. We're all just trying to figure it out. And to me, you, you kind of have to be OK to live in that space that like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, I know what I think today. And I'm telling you, Sean, this is what I think. This is what I believe as of today but I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure it out as I go. Now I'm aggressively pursuing that. I'm trying hard. I want to be an excellent leader for the people in my life. Like I, I want all those things, but do I really know what I'm doing? No, not really. I'm just, I'm just really, um, I'm focused and determined and committed to continue trying to figure it out as I go. And I found that to be one that that in a way is inspiring to me because it's it's much more common than I would have thought prior to to, to recording with four hundred whatever fifty plus people so far. Oh, absolutely! It's funny. I've I've gotten to spend some some personal time uh, with the billionaires. So we've had a lot of in person um, off air conversations, and I was asking about a specific moment, kind of like one of the, those bigger type defining moments uh, in building his company. And I was basically like, what's going on when during this exact moment? And he was basically like, yeah, you know, rally the troops and everything. But to be honest, behind closed doors. 
I had no freaking idea what the hell was going on. <laughs> I was just trying to figure this stuff out. And it's just like, oh, wow. It just like drops them down in reality. So I, I'm so happy that, that you <laughs> highlighted that. One thing as we're going to wrap up here in a minute, I would love to know though, I mean, you're so motivated, inspiring. You, you truly do like unleash the potential in others. But I'm wondering, is there a mindset of yours that if you could just pass on to everyone starting out their career, you would love to do? Um, okay, f- a few things. Uh, let's say you're earlier in your career. Uh, everybody is community made. My friend Jason Gaynard uh, said that, and I completely agree with him. Everybody's community made. So nobody's really self-made. This whole self-made billionaire thing doesn't exist. Everybody's community made. We're all built based upon the people in our lives that are there. So I would, I would first, if I'm early in my career, and I didn't necessarily think of all these things, but, I, but I've, I've thought of them more now, focus one on being a great teammate. And I use teammate, you know, I'm a sports background, but that, that applies to anything. So focus on being a great pe- teammate, be there for others, sign up for things that are hard, do the things that other people don't necessarily want to do, be a great teammate too. Um, I think it's uh, useful to think of being a productive achiever. Again, achieve things in a way that are productive for society, for others, and for yourself. Be known as someone who is a productive achiever in whatever your job is. And then if you're trying to build a career, I, I, this was advice I got from Brian Miller, a, a leader who was in my organization at LexisNexis. If you're trying to build a great career, the table stakes are that you are excellent at your current job. You have to be excellent, right? Be so good they can't ignore you, as Steve Barton might say. But at the same time, in your own time, be working on skill, be working on developing the skills needed for the next job that you may want. Maybe it is from an individual contributor to a manager or from a, a manager of individual contributors to leading leaders, whatever it may be. Understand the skills necessary to be excellent at that job and be working on developing those in your own time. Build up your kind of playbook of what you're going to do well before you interview for that job. So it, so you're being excellent at your current job, table stakes, while at the same time preparing for something that you really want. And I found that to be good. So the three things is be a great teammate, be a productive achiever, be excellent at your current role, and be preparing for what could be next on your own time. I think if you do those things, that's kind of a good way to approach a good mindset, a good philosophical kind of approach to, to building a career for yourself. Damn, Ryan, it's, it's clear just how much time um, and effort you put into distilling down this. I, I just have such an appreciation for that. And one of the things that you hit on that I'm just such a fan of is raise your standards, right? Like yeah. table stakes is excellence. And you, you can see that within yourself. That's something you hold yourself to. I think that's so important. Well, another thing I would love to know is I look for those game-changing books as Tyler Cowen, those quake-type books that shake your foundation. For you, have there been any books like that that just kind of like reshaped your entire thought process or your trajectory overall? Uh, I'm not sure if I talked to you about this last time, but so in college, I played, played quarterback. Uh, I went to Miami university out of, out of high school. And at this, I, I played uh, I'm in, in the same class, same position as Ben Roethlisberger. So Ben and I went to Miami together and, Ultimately, you could guess how that 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 ended, and the fact that Ben beat me out for that job. Um, so much to the fact that I either could be his backup or change positions, and I elected for option three, which was to transfer to hopefully go win a job somewhere else, which I did at Ohio University, and that's where I graduated. The reason I share that story, Sean, is because in the world of quarterbacking, it's a zero sum game. One guy wins and one guy loses. Only one guy plays at a time. And to me. Um, Early in my career, I read a book called Give and Take by Adam Grant. And what give and take, the science behind that is that givers um, can win and that you can, uh, life can go well for you by doing everything within your power to help other people do well. And then both of you can win. And so it was a quake book for me. It was a mindset shift for me because I had just come from a world where I had to beat out other people in order to play, or they beat me out. It was black and white, right? Ones and zeros. But then you get out into the real world and you read a book like Give and Take, and you realize that's not how it works. We can both win. We can both have amazing things happen to us. 
as a quarterback on a team, that's not how it works. Because when he was playing and I wasn't, I was miserable, right? For the guys that I beat out, they were miserable, right? You don't go wanting to be a backup. You, you want to be the guy. Yeah. At least I think most do. So that, that to me, I, I thought I got into the business world and I was like, I got to kind of hold my card close. I don't need to share with anybody. Oh, how do you do it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Right. That type of like black and white. I read give and take and thought, why am I doing this? What, why am I not sharing what I've learned? Why am I not trying to be a great teammate? Why am I not trying to be a great mentor? And once I kind of made that shift, that's when good things happen for me in my career beyond just my individual performance. Then it started helping other people. I got promoted a few times after that. So to me, it, that was a quake moment where it's a very simple book. It's really, really well-written book. I advise people to read it, but, it, but especially if you come from a background like mine, where the world was black and white, you, you win, I lose, I win, you lose. Well, the real world isn't, isn't like that. And Give and Take is a book that helps share the science and some great stories for you to realize that, that that's, not, that's not the way the world works and that in order to win, we both can do it by trying to help one another. Oh, that was an awesome answer. Just really understanding, flourishing, unleashing the best in others and those positive sum games. Ryan, I'm so intrigued because you've interviewed so many people who dead or alive, just not a family member or friend, would you love getting to spend like an entire evening just asking anything of? Um, I guess the, the first person that actually comes to mind is I'm a, just a big music fan. I've been to over 50 Dave Matthews band concerts. I'd, it would have to be Dave Matthews for me. I know people make fun of me for that. I don't care. Uh, that would be my choice. I would love to sit with him. I've, I have got to meet him, but I haven't had to have an extended conversation with him. I would love to because I think being a creative leader, a leader of a band that sustains for more than 25 years is really hard to do. And to me, I think there's a lot of leadership to be learned from a conversation with him. There's a lot of creativity to be learned. I love the process of, of creating something from nothing, which is what songwriting is all about. So you actually write the words and then you bring the music to it. And then you have to collaborate with other people who have a different interests and different life experiences. Like what, what an amazing job of leadership Dave Matthews has done for his band to be touring and selling out everywhere they go now, uh, almost into their third decade. So to me, um, regardless of being made fun of, that's who I would pick. No, I'm a huge Dave Matthews fan. So I think it's an awesome answer. You are? That yeah, yeah. One, one okay. that hasn't come up before. But what I appreciate so much, I was just thinking about this. I did. A, I do a once a month deep dive called The Distillery. So I did Bob Iger. And he was talking about watching the Netflix documentary. You actually read about this in your book, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And this yeah. was like a game-changing moment for him because he was studying a different art form. So for you, interviewing Dave Matthews, and you just talked about there, like the creativity of songwriting, the, the leadership and management skills it takes to lead a band for 25 years. It's like you find these commonalities amongst all different domains. And I just have such an appreciation when people can see those things come out. Um, and you just do a tremendous job. I mean, this is a perfect segue into your new book, The Pursuit of Excellence, The Uncommon Behaviors of the World's Most Productive Achievers. I would love to make sure that we get the listeners to check this out. Obviously, it's going to be linked up uh, along with, with your first two episodes on uh, what got you there. But anything else you want to leave the listeners with about the book or how they can stay connected with you and maybe get, get involved in both your podcast, your uh, Mindful Monday newsletter, and then also any of your leadership circles? Yeah, learningleader.com. That's where that's the one stop shop for everything, whether it's books, podcasts, uh, circles, the speaking, everything I do is at learningleader.com, Sean. You know, I, I, I do want to acknowledge though, um, like I love your prep. I was pumped when, when, when we emailed back and forth about getting a chance to do this again because I just appreciate how much you put into this. It's no surprise that the show has grown to where you're at today, doing the things you're doing, dude. I'm just, it's just really cool. And this is, this is a part of like why this, this whole podcasting world can be so much fun is because we all can win. And it's, it's awesome to see a guy like you who works so hard at it, is diligent and cares and prepares. Dude, it's awesome. Like, it's just really, it's really cool to see. Thank you. Yeah, that, that truly is humbling and means a ton to me. So Ryan Hawk, I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.
When you got you there with Shonda Laney, got you there. And I want to thank you for watching another powerful episode of the What Got You There podcast. We drop new episodes every single Sunday. So if you subscribe to the page, you'll be the first one to see these powerful episodes. Remember, we deconstruct world-class performers to understand their strategy, tactics, and the routines they've used to help them become world-class in what they do. So if you want to understand and then implement these into your own life, you're going to want to subscribe to the page. Remember, we also put out a weekly newsletter called Momentum Monday, which is just a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, and watching behind the scenes. You can stay up to date and follow everything we're doing at whatgotyouthere.com. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Got you there.